sharing the screen. Okay, so so this month's IPM IPDM update for ornamentals, and we're focusing on some summer pests. So next slide, please. Um, and so just some of the principles of integrated pest and disease management. Remind ourselves really. Um, won't read them all out, but the, the overall game is to keep health crops healthy and proactively prevent problems, reducing pest use, pesticide usage, and weekly monitoring is really the key to success to achieving all of these, these goals. Okay, next slide. So we're focusing on some summer pests this month, and we've got capsids to kick off. Um, they're a small, fairly elusive pest. They can be difficult to spot. They're very active and uh, often uh, try and elude us when we're looking for them. So on the image on that hookerella, I think it was, um, on the right of that leaf in the foreground, there's an adult capsid there, uh, just to sort of illustrate what they look like. Um, they fly, and when you're scouting in the crop, the adults particularly will often drop out of the crop as sort of a defense and survival mechanism or they'll fly off. So they are difficult to find and quite often we see the damage before the actual pest for that reason. Um, the nymphs don't have wings and they can be a bit easier to spot. There's quite a bit of color variation within capsids. So they can be sort of from pale yellow to green to red and brown. And there's a few different species that can be a, a pest problem for us and we'll come on to those in the coming slides. Now the real issue with this pest is its feeding activity. The saliva of the, the pest is sort of toxic to a plant and kills the plant tissue. So it, it sucks sap from the plant and uh, you get this ragged tattered effect wherever the pest is fed. And we'll look at a picture of that in, in the coming slides just to illustrate the point. Um, just flagging up some species are beneficial. Um, so there are the odd, I have come across the odd ornamental grower under glass using uh, Macrolophus, which is a predatory species of capsid that's used primarily in tomatoes. Um, they're just trialing it on some uh, thrips control um, and caterpillar control in, in protected roses. Um, I don't think we've really learned enough to comment how effective that is at this stage. We're just flagging that up, really. Um, I'd be, for, any, for anyone else, I'd tend to stick to the, the more mainstream predators for those pests, which we've covered in other sessions and can revisit if anyone needs a bit more information on those. OK, so next slide, please. So here are some of the damage symptoms um, damage inflicted on Fatsia japonica here, and they typically target soft young growth um, gives them a nice feeding opportunity and the damage sort of gets worse as this growth grows and tatters and rips and you can see the mess that's made of the fatsia and that that damage on that particular species obviously stays with a plant a long time and can make it very unmarketable so they can be a real problem um, the buds and shoots as you can see can be severely damaged um, Flowers from damaged buds can also be deformed. They occur, can occur under protection and outdoors, but probably more often outdoors. Um, just listed some key hosts there, but a couple that really stand out are Choicy and Caryopteris. If you're growing Caryopteris and you don't get capsid damage, um, I'd say you're extremely, extremely lucky. Um, also, the pest attacks a wide range of soft fruits. So if anyone's growing soft fruit, um, either commercially to pick or, or in pots to market as a potted product, you, you're likely to come across some capsids and capsid damage. OK, next slide. <clears throat> so thinking about some of the, the species we can get, um, there are a few species probably don't get too hung up on identifying them down to species level because the controls are largely the same. It's just sort of for interest this bit really and to build a bit of knowledge. So there's a common green and potato capsid which look fairly similar. They're green, green bugs. Um, and first generations females lay eggs in the stems and the leaf 
petioles and that's roughly where the life cycle of the pest would be now so you if you've had them you'd have seen some damage and they'll be the eggs will have been laid or being laid and uh, you may well have some nymphs about which give rise to the second generation which mature into the autumn and then lay over wintered eggs on woody hosts before dying off so just a bit on the life cycle to understand how they persist from year to year these eggs hatch in the spring, feed on young growth, and then often move on to softer, herbaceous summer hosts. They, a lot of weeds are host for them, so another we, a reason for keeping your sites as weed-free as you can. It, it helps to reduce pest pressure, and we're aware that weeds can host a lot of other pests as well. Um, <clears throat> potato capsid seems to be, be a bit later. Um, it may be a bit earlier, with yourselves, with the earliness of the Pembrokeshire, in particular sort of new potatoes. So just bear that in mind um, and just flagging up the fact that it likes members of the Asteraceae family. So things like chrysanthemum um, can occur on. Okay, next slide. So apple capsid, um, nymphs are yellowy green, adults bright green, so not that many differences. Um, the adults are maturing by about now and uh, laying over wintering eggs before dying out. So their, their life cycle sort of angled towards the front of the year. And these eggs overwinter on Malus and some other woody hosts, I imagine, um, they potentially overwinter on other hosts in the rosaceous genus as well. Um, <clears throat> these eggs hatch in spring and give rise to the next generation of a the pest feeding on the apples and the apple trees when they're young and soft so that's that's the stage they seem to really like and once you've got your eye in um you'll easily spot capsid damage on apples it's a slightly raised bump and that's where they fed and you'll even pick it up on apples coming through the supply chain in supermarkets you'll see the odd one with capsid damage coming through so um, they're a problem for the commercial fruit sector as well, but uh, just wanted to flag it up with Malus being quite an important genus. Okay, next slide. There's also the European tarnish plant bug. Um, this one looks a bit different. Um, colours can be a bit more variable, sort of yellowy green with red and brown markings and quite a different life cycle so the adults are overwintering here in leaf litter in the base of hedges etc um, and the adults emerging and then laying eggs <coughs> so this one potentially may occur a bit earlier in the season um, and at the moment populations are often high um, and frequently breed up in weeds as i said weeds are, can be a problem and then can migrate into ornamental crops so Another good reason to keep the nursery as weed free as is possible. Okay, next slide. So monitoring aids, a few years ago, there was a, a, a trap developed um, for European tarnish plant bug, and that's the web link for the supplier Agrilan. And it's, I forget the price, but it's sort of in the region of 40 to 50 pounds. And um, you don't need high density traps so it's something that people might find useful um, it's not going to give you control it's just a monitoring aid as i said they're elusive pests so when you're trying to look for them as we do for most pests with a, a hand lens and uh, on your crop walks they are difficult and, and one of the methods you can employ to catch them out is to if you're suspecting or wanting to look for them tap onto a notepad or a piece of white card held under the foliage and their mechanism of escape is often to drop. So you'll catch them out by catching them on your white card. Um, but they are, even when you're monitoring, they, they can be easy to miss and sometimes you'll see the damage before you see the pest. Okay, um, next David. slide. David? Yep. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, I just, just, just to sort of interject, if I, I just was wondering, actually, capsids, I mean, they, uh, if, if people have problems with them, really, they're, they're a bit of an odd pest, aren't they? Because they don't have a, a, a very wide host range, unlike, say, aphids or, <laughs> or, I suppose, thrips and spider mites. But 
as you've highlighted with that snap of fats here earlier on that, that I recognise actually, um, they do cause significant damage, don't they? You know, I mean, they can take crops off, off sale very quickly. Yeah. So it is, it is one if people aren't familiar with it, worth just, just sort of being aware of and becoming a little bit more familiar with really. And uh, uh, because as I say, it's not got the big host range, but when it, when it gets active and gets established in the crop, it can make quite a, create quite a lot of damage. Yeah, yeah, and a good good point, Andrew. I mean, I've mentioned caryopteris, and I've seen, yeah. you know, batches of caryopteris, which generally isn't grown in huge quantities, pretty much decimated by capsids, and you either have to cut them back or, or take them off sale, and they've, they've got a relatively short sales window because most people like to buy them when they're in flower. And, uh, good point, good point. They're prone to the damage just before that point, so... Um, yeah, I think some, somebody else mentioned choice here on, on the chat, which is another one. And sometimes the damage is not too dissimilar to, to that caused by water snails, mm. you know, which are, which also like choice here. Um, so yeah. uh, that's just worth being aware of sometimes. It's easy, easy <clears> to confuse the actual symptoms, really. But but choice are also a bit like caryoptis, aren't they? They're a favourite host of, uh, of capsid bug. And yes. again, being an evergreen crop, they can, it's a very, very visual and they sold, you know, so sort of throughout the year, aren't they, really? So, again, they can very quickly affect saleability. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, so they're, they're not an easy pest, but uh, no. one to be aware of, really, and uh, part of the reason we're flagging it up today. So, so as I say, they're not an easy pest, and that kind of extends to its control as well. Um, <clears throat> so there's no definitive information available on natural enemies that predate or parasitize capsids. There's been some research done relatively recently funded by HGB, um, part of their SEPTA program. And one of the sort of outcomes of this is that it's widely believed that the presence of aureus in crops helps to control capsid, but that's not scientifically proven. That's just a feeling people have and an observation that people have made across the industry. Um, <clears throat> so that's something that people can bear in mind. Um, but then aureus is, is not much use outside because it's so mobile and can fly off. It can occur naturally, of course, but uh, it's just something to bear in mind um okay next slide so for control we're normally looking at spraying um and we've got a few options there we've got steward which has got near mu um we've got gazelle sg but some people are reluctant to use that day that these days because it's a neonicotinoid um main man which is um used for aphids as well but um it's a difficult one because we've only got three sprays of main man and we haven't got many insecticides for aphids so i've got people that have had the odd capsid but they've not felt it and particularly people that don't want to use gazelle um they've not felt it bad enough to spray for and uh they've wanted to help hold back those main man sprays for their aphid control because they feel that's a bigger issue for them but that's that's something to to decide in front of your crop really um also some of the the bioprotectants um can be considered so naturalis l that can be used in protected ornamentals and botanic guard wp that's permanent protection with full enclosure only um, they may have a fix against some of the pest species. Um, those two products are both the same, same active, if you like, very natural thing, uh, Bavaria bassiana. So they're just different trade names from formulations. So similar products, but different, different fields of use. Um, in that natural oil, it's, it's, it's more flexible. We can use that in tunnels, but you can't use botanic garden tunnels it's permanent protection with full enclosure which definition pretty much links to a glass house really D david can i uh, just a quick one on gazelle um, yeah um yeah as you as you mentioned because it's a neonicotinoid there's some reluctance to use it uh, despite the fact it's, it's actually a you know if you use sensibly as per label to application to crop a very effective product but i just yeah. think with capsules where you need that systemic activity particularly whether um sequoia might be a 
an option for Fox of Floor. I don't know if under permanent protection, I'm not sure if anybody's. Yes, it would be. Again, it's quite interesting. Would, would be another one. Um, the, its main limitation is its permanent protection with full enclosure again. Yeah. So, um, yeah. it's. It, yeah, it, and we, we uh, don't know really, do we? It's um, it's it's still yeah, like one, new, isn't it? But one to try, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Sprutzik, possibly. Yes, possibly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's another permanent exactly. protection these days, isn't it? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. So moving on to leaf hoppers, another challenging pest, um, and. These sorts of pests, capsid and leafhoppers, have sort of come about and, and increased in number and frequency because they were taken out largely by the nasty sort of insecticides that people used to spray for other pests. So they've sort of increased in occurrence um, as, as we've moved more down the uh, integrated approach, really. But leafhoppers, they're small, they're about three millimetres long and live on the underside of leaves. The adults are winged and readily disperse and take off when disturbed. Um, the nymphs are wingless and they sort of molt fairly regularly, um, moving through their different life stages. Um, so you can find these car skins of the nymphs and they're a useful identification tool because they're sometimes easier to find than the adults. Um, but they cause this white or yellow flecking, as you can see on that digitalis below, um, affect quite a wide range of hosts. Um, certainly a problem. Next slide, please. So we've got a few key species. Um, we've got the glasshouse lock leafhopper, um, targets in hosts include fuchsia and primula, um, got sage leaf hop, which commonly affects a range of herbs and things like lavateria. And then got rhododendron leaf hopper, which is really a problem for people growing that crop. Um, and that's linked to the pathogen that causes bud blast. So that's something for rhododendron growers to consider. Okay, next slide. So, few changes in biocontrols. Um, we used to be able to use a predator called a nagras. Um, it's no longer available. Um, I, I never really came across anyone that had brilliant results of it. Um, so uh, it's, it's a loss, but I'm not sure how big a loss it is. Um, anyway, they a study's been done on herbs and has identified a few things listed here, and that was part of the AHDB Sector Plus program. So, aureus and lace wings have been identified as having potential for leaf hop control. Um, and lace wings are a useful predator, they naturally occur anyway. And some people are introducing them these days for aphid control. Um, where, where people aren't spraying, pyrethroids etc you see these uh, these problem these predators uh, occurring in the crop naturally as well also wasps may take nymphs um wasps are quite a useful predator um so if you've got a wasp nest and it's not giving you any bother it's uh, quite often worth living and let live they'll take caterpillars aphids and a range of pests so just flagging those up um, nematodes are another option but they have to be applied in the right conditions they been proven to kill leafhopper nymphs in so for the juvenile stage in the lab under optimum conditions but they didn't perform in the same way in the glasshouse trial and that was probably due to high temperatures drying the nematodes out quickly so <clears throat> it really is thinking about the optimum time to apply nematodes if you're using them so i would always say they're best applied early evening when targeting the foliar pests now, the challenge for most nurseries um, early evening at this time of year is, is very late in the day. It doesn't fit with a lot of um, nurseries working practices with people typically choosing to start earlier in the day and finishing sort of early afternoon. But perhaps for smaller businesses where you've got a bit more flexibility and you're able to nip out and spray after tea um, or even 
a bit later than that in the high days of summer um that would be that how to get the best from, from nematodes i would say also worth bearing in mind that more than one application of nematodes is likely to be necessary because if you're just taking the nymphs it's it's a while before you break the life cycle so you need to keep monitoring and seeing how the population is and if you're still seeing adults you'll still be getting nymphs and uh, keep up the ante on them really so probably weekly applications if you're going down the nematode route david just a couple of comments coming in um from andrew doesn't generally have problems with capses but leaf hoppers can be a problem and uh, Callum, I thought also saying leaf hop is a serious problem for him on sage and rosemary. Yeah, yeah. And I see them frequently on, on those crops. They are a, a real chew um, and they make a mess of them and affect their marketability. And they seem like many insects, they thrive the warmer it is, the more they sort of thrive and the life cycle speeds up. So they're a real problem. And it's well worth sort of planning some controls into your, your production programs to take account of these pests. Um, so we've got a couple of IPM compatible insecticides and uh, Andrew previously flagged up sequoia. So on ornamentals, that was probably another option you could consider. Um, also main man, we've got the AMU for that. Um, but bearing in mind, we're limited to the three applications. Um, then gazelles, the other option, it is a neonicotinoid, but as far as I'm aware, Andrew, it's the only thing that's authorised for use on herbs is a product for the control of the pest. I think you're right, David. I think you're right. Yeah. I was just thinking about gazelle. It's, you know, just whether people are nervous about using it. It's, it, it's a bit of a shame on that because I think it's regarded as one of the sort of safer class of neonicotinoids, isn't it, that so far remains legal tender. I think its future is always under question but i think you know it, it does have a role if you stick to the label i think it's just the two applications per crop um yeah it can work very well and it's still a very useful sort of control tool for growers isn't it really um, yeah. i'm not sure about, yeah. about herbs but i think you're probably right about that yes it's it's got this emu for herbs and and i think from memory it's a three-day harvest interval so you can't right. sell the treated herbs within right. three days of being um sprayed and uh and <clears throat> yeah, it's been tarred with the same brush as the other neonicotinoids. Um, yeah. So data that suggests its B profile safety is is far far higher than the others. Um, so it's it's often a personal decision whether people choose to be comfortable with using it, um, and, uh, and what the people they're supplying are comfortable with as well. A lot of the bigger retailers are saying no, we don't want it used. Um, but it's definitely a useful product. Um, it's only a couple of applications a year, as we've said, so it's not going to solve your leaf hopper issue, no. but it's another iron in the fire. So you could perhaps use it as a knockdown to take the adults and, and the nymphs out, knock them back, and then go down the nematode route, as alluded to in the previous slide, to sort of uh, have a double pronged attack, really. Hello. Yeah, I, th I think you're right, David. The, the, the pressure seems to come from the major retailers, particularly, doesn't it, really, who are very nervous about any new nicotinoids. So I yeah. think that's been a, a factor, as you say, in, yeah. in reduced use of gazelle. But as I say to growers, it is still, you know, we, we want to promote responsible use of these products, particularly near nicotinoids. But it's, it, it is a very useful product as long as it's not overused. <laughs> that's the other issue with it is the resistance. Uh, to, you know, not to overexpose it really. So targeted yeah. and timely use of it, I still think it's, it's got an important role as long as we can continue to have it, you know. I just, yeah. just clarify, when you say safe, safer, you mean safer to bees and things, pollinators? Yes, its bee profile was much better than the other near right. Um Yeah. Okay. Um, with all these products we're, we're talking about, um, which are IPM compatible, it does vary a little bit between um, between the predators you're using. So I'd always encourage you to check on one of the crops sort of safety databases. So you've got the bio line, they've got a crop safety app that you can download and check compatibility with products and predators. Um, BioBest do one, Copper do one. They're all easily found on the internet. So they're well worth checking, just double checking 
which predators you want to use with these products for a bit of extra guidance, really. I think that's a good point, David. I, I always say to people on, on this compatibility issue, because it, it'll become very knotty, doesn't it? And, and, and a little complicated is to I very, very broadly <laughs> sort of classify them into three groups, which is the relatively safe, um, the moderately harmful and the harmful. So I, I think of them like looking at a league table and those at the top are the usually the safer shot persistent sort of contact and physically acting products, aren't they? Like the Majestics, Eradicote Max, yeah. Flipper, for example, anybody using Flipper. Um, Gazelle is one of those I, I tend to put maybe just going into mid table as, as one that needs a little bit more care and a little bit more with timing and, and perhaps you might just spot spray rather than use it too widely that kind of thing uh, mm. and leave a little bit of space between if you do need to come in with it as a support spray to your bio controls just just to back off your bio controls put your spray on do your cleaning but then come <coughs> back in with your bios maybe after a week or two um, and then down at the bottom we've got the, our old friend the pyrethroids haven't we the dates and hallmarks which are really no go uh, products if you like if you're using bio and they will just wreck your bio program yeah yeah so so gazelle is a bit like dynamic is one of those i think that kind of sits sits just on the edge isn't it really mm. yeah and in those crop safety tables we've mentioned and talked about there are gaps so there's not data for everything um and uh, we have to make an educated guess where that's the case. So if it's safe on other things, you kind of have to assume it's it's okay on yeah. the gaps and yeah. just leave a bit of time if you can. That's the best you can do. Um, just a point with spray application, um, various studies on spray application have shown that getting product on the underside side of leaves is extremely difficult, um, to, regardless of your application method. So... <clears throat> While the, the knockdown products of the Majestics or Redicotes can give a useful knockdown, um, they're, they're not going to give you total control because you're not going to hit every one of those on the underside of a leaf. So that's just another thing to be aware of. So that's the beauty of the main man and gazelle. They are systemic products, so they will travel through the leaf and, and give you that control throughout the crop. <coughs> OK, next slide. So moving on to caterpillars, another pest that's a bit challenging. Um, Seem to have been a lot of caterpillar pressure about this year, particularly early in the year. Um, various species, normally a moth, are affecting ornamental crops. Um, and the same old caveat applies to a lot of problems. Control is easier at the start of the infestation. So when caterpillars are small, we've got more um, IPM compatible products that take small caterpillars. When you get into large caterpillars, it gets a bit trickier. Um, so before we get into the nitty and gritty of control, just looking at a few of the species. So we've got um, native moth called silver Y, but its numbers are often topped up, if you like, by Southern European visitors that migrate in, quite a large moth, um, and they've got a silver wire on the wing, and we've got an image of that coming up in the next slide or two, just to, to make you aware of that if you haven't seen that one. Um, I haven't really seen silver wire about this year, Andrew, in the Midlands no. and around here. Um, have you seen any with you? No, not seen with it at all, David, over on the east. Um, and, no. and I suppose in the north northwest where I tend to go so far. No, so I mean it's the season's not finished by any no. means, but no. it's uh, haven't really seen any. So anyway, caterpillars are, have a yellowy green head, um, quite large, so sort of about three centimeters long. Sorry, four centimeters long, and uh, just a few hosts listed there. Although it will attack other things. Um, one of the but well, a couple of the key species, I would say, for nursery stock are carnation tortrix moth and light brown apple moth. Um, carnation tortrix moth's probably been more of a problem for the sector for longer. And then light brown apple moth seems to have found a bit of a niche and moved in as well. Um, I remember John Buxton, a late colleague of ours, doing work on it and identifying it some years ago. And it sort of seems to have become more and more common on nursery stock from then. And uh, quite often you'll have both species sort of in tandem in crops. So the caterpillars look pretty much identical. They web their leaves together and feed within that silken cocoon where they're protected from predators and, and pesticides, worse luck. Um, quite a wide host range. They seem to favour 
evergreen crops in particular, um, but they're not limited to evergreen crops. Um, and they create a lot of damage. They uh, <coughs> tatter and tuba leaves and the webbed up cocoons that they feed in stay webbed up and, and damaged even when the caterpillars have been and gone. Um, so they're an important species for us. Um, we've got other species, including the angle shades moth, cabbage moth, tomato moth, um, and even diamondback moths and things can occur on things within the brassica family, like erysiums, um, wallflowers. And just that image before we move on to the next slide, small caterpillars often create this windowing effect. So they feed on the underside of the leaves because it's the safest place for them. And when they're small, they're not quite able to bite right through the leaf and you can see, see that to the left of the caterpillar. So you'll get these sort of windows of tissue left, which normally drop out and die after a short period. But that's, that's a really indication that it's caterpillars and not slugs. Um, caterpillars can be quite hard to find. You often find the feeding damage and sometimes their feces are, are easier to find than the pest. So some caterpillars, can feed under the cover of darkness when there's less predators about. And when looking for caterpillar feces, if you're not, i.e. poo, if you're not familiar with it, it tends to be round, um, whereas slug or snail feces are sort of long and stringy, if you like, and you'll often find the slime trails as well with mollusks. So uh, that's just a bit of a, a tip to help identify. I mean, it can be tricky sometimes to find them. So finding the poo is sometimes the easiest way. So. Next slide. I think just a quick one there, David. That's a, an interesting point you make about that partial feeding, isn't it? Because uh, sometimes I'm, I'm sure you're the same. You're looking at a crop and, and you think it's one thing, maybe slug, but it could possibly be quite easily be caterpillar, actually, couldn't it? Uh, yeah. Except the slug <laughs> tends to go right through the leaf, doesn't it? And then yeah. you get this sort of feeding underneath, this sort of partial sort of damage of the leaf, and then it gradually kind of dies out, doesn't it? You get this sort of window in effect. But yeah. that's, that's a, a good little point, actually. And, and just about the two caterpillars, I, I'm certainly seeing more light brown caterpillar. I, I think carnation tortix is still the number one, isn't it, for nursery stock, certainly. But I'm seeing more of the others as well. Um, yeah. and, and the key is spotting them early, isn't it, to get good control? Yeah, yeah. Which is so, where you've got own traps coming, I think. Yes, yes. So the, the image below just shows that windowing in a easier to see um larger image so a smallish caterpillar not able to quite bite through the whole leaf but it's it's nibbling the green tissue out and leaving the, the window hence the windowing name also the top image there is the silver y moth um, and you can see that sort of silvery y on its wing that's facing us that aids its identification so it's quite an easy one to spot once you get your eye in so Moths locate females through pheromones, um, so sex pheromones, so that's how they, they find a mate. Um, and these pheromones of key, um, hang on, Andrew's just put a question in. Um, I think you mean dipel rather than dispel, but um, we'll come to that in a, a minute, Andrew. Um, so monitoring aids with pheromone traps, um, pheromones are key pest species have been synthesized and can be used in traps to trap and attract the males. Um, and this gives us useful information about which pests are about in the crops. Um, so if we're catching the males, it's likely the females will be about and caterpillars will soon follow. So um, we've got pheromone traps for silver wide, carnation tortrix, and light brown apple moth. <coughs> I haven't really come across anyone using pheromones for silver wire. I don't know whether you have, Andrew. No, no, just use the carnation tortrix and like that yeah. apple. Yeah. So far. Yeah, so silver wire, I wouldn't say is as big a problem. Um, and because the, yeah. the moths come in, in in an influx typically, um, and they're quite big and easy to spot. Um, and I would say carnation tortoise and light brown apple moth are, are challenging to control because unless you get them when they're small, they're protected in those webbed leaves and they, they are devils to get. Um, anyway, we'll come back to that in a minute. I think particularly in IPM systems, David, isn't it, where we're limited to the, what I tend to call a softer 
shop persistence product, Dipel, I think I think was mentioned. We'll come on to that in a second, no doubt. Yeah. But if you wanted to use those products, you need to do an IPM. That's when you nearly really need the early spotting of the young caterpillar, isn't it? Because that's when those products yeah. are going to be give you the best chance of getting control. Yeah, yeah. Um, so lures are put into special commercially available little plastic tents, really. Um, and perspex type, not perspex, I can't think of a word. Corex board, like the stuff Corex boards are made out of. Um, and they're typically white or green. Um, and the suppliers give information on how, how far apart they should be placed, etc. cetera. Um, just a note on laws, um, never mix them up. I don't put two, same, two laws in the same trap. Um, because it won't work and you need to be careful when you're handling the lures make sure you're wearing gloves or washing your hands between handling different lures when you're setting traps up because you'll contaminate them with different pheromones and it, it's unlikely to perform as well as it should um, again suppliers have information but lures should typically be changed every six weeks and uh, it's worth monitoring your catches weekly People take different approaches. Some people just count the cumulative number of moths on the traps by week to give them an idea of what's going on and record that on a sort of notepad or similar, or some people have made up little uh, recording sheets for this purpose. Um, and some people scrape them off, but it's a bit of a messy job with the glue. Um, it just, it's what suits you best really. Um, so that's that on monitoring. So next slide, please. So onto the biocontrol of caterpillars, um, we've got sprayable bacterium called Bacillus sundriensis, which has been about for a lot of years, um, various products from different suppliers. We've got Agree 50WG or Dipol DF, um, same products, just different names, different suppliers. It's effective against most species, but we need to get it on when they're small. Um, you really want to spray it onto dry foliage, first sign of damage or when adult moths are caught in your pheromone traps. Um, so we're relying on the, sorry, I put a typo in there, it should say pest ingestion, not post. Yeah, so the pest ingesting the, the treated foliage um, and following that, feeding ceases fairly rapidly. Um, but a note of caution really, the bacterium that we sprayed on is washed off by irrigation or rain and good coverage of a crop is necessary. So you really want to be planning the application of such products around your irrigation to get the most bang for your buck before you wash them off with the next irrigation cycle, particularly where you're overhead irrigating and for outdoor crops, taking account of the weather as well. Um, caterpillars normally killed two to five days. We said the young ones are most susceptible. The adults and eggs are not affected by the, the path that, bacterium so it's very much a timing thing so if you go too early you might be a bit a bit too keen um, but we've got a number of sprays of these products typically so um, we've got reg making regular sprays is important where needed um, and where things get away from you if you sort of struggle with control of that first generation you can soon get in a into a situation where you've got multiple generations occurring in the crop so the timing of these sorts of products gets trickier um, so another approach particularly under protection is use of triclogramma egg parasites it's not a widely used predator in the uk um, we did a research project on it funded by hdb a few years ago and uh, it's actually an egg parasite and it we used them um, like brown apple moth and tortrix so that as our test species to test it on and it worked very well and the beauty of it 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 turns the egg scales of these the moths black when it's parasitized them and when it finds an egg scale um the egg scales are relatively easy to spot once you get your eye in um they look a bit like fish eggs they're um they're green and they're probably about half the size of a five pence piece. Um, and uh, 
anyway, when they, these predators parasitize the egg scales, they'll, they'll turn black. And when they find an egg scale, they generally lay an egg in every single egg within that egg scale. And typical egg scale probably contains sort of about 25 eggs of these species. So what happens if they're not parasitized, the caterpillars hatch and disperse and then start feeding. So you don't find big clusters of them. Um, just a sort of word of caution with this predator, it's supplied in diapause, so those eggs don't hatch instantly. So if you put, they, they come on a card a bit like um, in Carsia for most of the uh, predator for whiteflies, people who use that. So if you put them straight out and they're subjected to overhead irrigation, mice can feed on them, et cetera, et cetera you don't always get the best from them. So in the trials, we found that they could take sort of 10 to 12 days to hatch post delivery from the supplier. So the advice is really to put them in a Petri dish in your office or next to your computer or somewhere where you are regularly looking um, and keep an eye on them. And then as soon as they start to hatch, put them outside. They are quite small, so you need keen eyesight. And if, if your eyesight is not quite so good, it's worth a quick look at the hand lens every day just to see what's going on so you don't miss some hatching and get them out. Um, another approach is that's sort of been tried is using nematodes. So Steinonema carpocapsi is another option, um, but the same sort of uh, considerations as to, to terms of application timing late in the day apply as to when we were talking about nematodes for rubber pests earlier in the, the presentation. Anything you'd like to add there, Andrew? No, I, I've had one or two growers try tracker gamma with mixed success, uh, David. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why. They may not have just been following the ground rules that you've just been mentioning. It's quite interesting what you're saying there, actually, uh, about how you use them. It's, it's often the way with biocontrols, isn't it? It's kind of how you use them, where you put them, when you put them out, how you put them out. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I just suspect rather than being a problem with the track of grammar, which, which, which I think is potentially very, very useful uh, biocontrol, suspect it's perhaps just been on a bit of a learning curve and been a bit put off, but I would encourage people to, to have a go with them because, because caterpillars can be, as, we, as you've been saying, just really difficult to control, particularly if you don't get in there very early with them. So mm -hmm. I would say give them a try by all means. Yeah, and I think that's why the trickler grammar hasn't really taken it off taken off and isn't that widely used it's a bit of a faff um but with this dipole thing and keeping it in the pet tradition checking it every day this is another thing to think about when you're extremely yeah. busy but um in the trials we did get up to 90 percent parasitism of uh, egg scales so it's it certainly can deliver a lot um and and can work very well so it's something to consider okay Yeah, and Alison's made the point that uh, other larger predators are very useful. Birds uh, helping as well. So, yeah, everything helps. Okay, next uh, this one. So, thinking about some IPM compatible pesticide control caterpillars, we haven't got that many options. Um, conserve is one option, but again, more effective on smaller caterpillars. So. Um, if you miss the boat with Dipel or Agree, Conserve's not really the product to go to. Um, it's harmful to parasitic wasps, so uh, it's just one I flagged up because it's known to be a problem, so just worth bearing that in mind. And just the picture to the right there shows some early leaf rolling, I think that was light brown apple moth um, from memory, um, and they can wed leaves up if you haven't seen the pest completely and, and create much more of a sort of canopy than webbed together than, than that. And they'll often affect the growing tips. I only saw them yesterday on some Lanistra grown outside actually um, in three litre containers and they were affecting the tips of the crop and uh, completely webbing that growing tip together. Um, another thing we haven't really talked about where you've missed the boat with IPM compatible controls um, because a lot of them are, are useful on or more effective on smaller caterpillars. Don't forget they can be pruned out um, or picked off and squashed depending on the area you've got to get around. It's another good cultural method of stopping those caterpillars getting to the, the egg laying stage. So it's, it's something to, 
have in the back of your mind as you get out of jail card, perhaps. Um, stewards, another option. But again, Andrew, I'd probably say better on the smaller caterpillars. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. And I was just thinking about our good friend Sprutzik, David. I've had quite yeah. a bit of decent success with Sprutzik, Pyrethra, and Pyrethra and yeah. 5EC, as, as we used to be able to use, no longer available to us, but Sprutzik still is under permanent protection. I think yeah. I'm right in saying, David, and, and I you know, get some good results. But again, you do the earlier the better, but it will take, I think, the slightly larger caterpillars. Yeah, yeah. I have had the odd person have a little bit of scorch with it. Oh, right. OK, OK. Um, let's I haven't come across some, that. That's interesting. Some people off um, on soft growth, very soft growth. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and again, I think it's kind of reasonably safe. It falls into that in terms of bios, isn't it? With with care, I think it's kind of yeah. maybe a, a little bit mid-table, perhaps, but um, <laughs> you know, not quite in the same league as, as Dipel or Agri that you've been mentioning there. But I think it's you know used sensibly. It's it's reasonably safe in in IPM bio systems. Yeah, yeah. Okay, next slide, please. So moving on to vine weevil. Um, just thinking about them as an important pest and um, we covered them before and just sort of flagging them up really. So um, controlling the larvae and nematodes is our main line of defense really. Um, we need the larvae to be present to kill. Although there's been interest in uh, little and often approaches nematodes, so applying them sort of monthly. And this can fit with people that have got sort of rapid turnover of stock or stock coming in. Um, because the tr more traditional approach was a couple of applications in the autumn and the fear with the two applications in the autumn, if, if there's a lot of stock movement through the business, you might get stock that misses those two applications and you've got gaps in your control. So that's sort of one of the reasons people are interested, perhaps in the little and often. Um, <coughs> and it David, probably... David, so can I, can I just pause you before, just a couple of quick comments come in before we leave, before we sort of get too much into buying weevil. Is yes, Alison is asking, she's just saying that she finds blue tits are good at controlling caterpillars. Yes, what, yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're a known important predator in, in woodlands and such like. Yeah, I so. guess they are, right? yeah, yeah. So it's an interesting one. And actually just hopping further back, found the bunch of leaf hopper. Andrew was just asking, I'm not aware of any work, has any work been done on sticky traps attracting leaves? Yes, sorry. Yes, Jude's done some work and that's something okay. to mention. So thanks for flagging sorry, up, Andrew. up yeah. Andrew. Yeah, that, that can help to control numbers and is another approach to take. So um, it's not going to give you total wipeout, but it can certainly help. So yeah, it, as is often the case with IPDM, it's it's there's no silver bullet to crack some of these problems, but if we can nibble at them from different angles, we can suppress things or, or achieve control that way. So, <clears throat> Sorry, David. Okay, no, sorry, I missed those points. Okay. Um, okay. So with, with nematodes for vine weevil, important to follow labels carefully, um, removing any filters, in your sprayers or dosatrons because they can trap them and prevent them being applied. Um, you need to keep the solution agitated because the nematodes will drown if it's not agitated properly because um, the water phase is really only to distribute them. They don't naturally sort of dwell in water. They want to be in moist grow media, particularly with the nematodes for vine weevil. Um, so if you're applying with a dosatron, something as crude as someone gently stirring it with a bamboo cane is enough to keep them agitated. Um, if you're applying nematodes for vine weevil, it's worth washing them off the foliage with a bit of irrigation because they're not going to do any good on the foliage. Um, avoiding application in sunshine because they're sensitive to UV light. Uh, and that sort of uh, is an another reason for applying nematodes for other species late in the day. Also, we want for others, popping back to other species when we're using nematodes for other species, control of other pest species, we want the leaves to remain wet for as long as possible because those nematodes need that film of water to move about on the foliage. I forgot to mention that earlier, because as soon as that foliage is dry, those nematodes can't move about and they quickly desiccate. So if they haven't found their prey, they've missed the boat really um anyway back to 
to vine weevil monitoring is important so check any known infested plants after 10 days you need to ensure the growing media is moist at the time of application so if it's if it's too dry you can get dry spots that the drench doesn't penetrate um, and you want to keep that growing media on the moist side for at least a couple of weeks after application to allow those nematodes to move around and find those fine weevil larvae that you're seeking to control. <clears throat> Have you got many people using nematodes little and often, Andrew? Um, I wouldn't say little and often. They, they do use them. Uh, again, I think it's application, isn't it, really? I, I was going to say with mixed results, it's probably unfair. I mean, I, I mean, I do think they are a very effective means of controlling, but people that are so that always realize you need the larvae to be present, your, your top yeah. point there. Some people mistakenly perhaps use them preventatively, but they do actually need the larvae to be there. Um, I've not got them at the moment use them on the little and often sort of system that you mentioned there, David, actually, but I do think it certainly has some scope to for people to, it may be easier for growers actually to use them and therefore increase the uptake of using nematodes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, no, carry on. Okay. It's, uh, I think the life cycle's probably become a bit more blurred definitely, um, definitely. With, with the milder winters. And we've found out that adults are overwintering now. Um, and uh, and they, they will start egg laying earlier in the season than larvae that have emerged that season because larvae typically have to feed for sort of two or three weeks to get sufficient energy reserves before they can start egg laying. So, um that's another factor and it's something that came from the soft yeah. fruit world a bit um and it, it's something that people can use if if they choose to and if it fits their production systems and that's that's probably the best i think the point about the life cycle moving around david's a good one isn't it i mean you know with the milder winters but also more and more stuff going under protection yeah which, which yeah. changes things a little bit doesn't it you know once upon a yeah. time that the vine with a life cycle was, was reasonably clear cut wasn't it with summer egg laying and you know and then larvae emergence and then over winter feeding autumn winter into early spring and then pupation but that's that sort of moved around a bit which which slightly complicates use of nematodes and just getting the timing right doesn't it you know yeah definitely definitely so <clears throat> yeah in, as is often the case it doesn't get any easier but such is life um, just a quick one, uh, chat. David Andrew was saying early in the season, dragonfly.co.uk supply feltii. Uh, question is that any good? Because it's dynanema feltii. Yes, dynanema feltii. Which it is. You know. um, yeah. Um, which is not one of the low temperature sort of nematodes, Andrew, really, but, but no. But no, will give some no. control. I think a lot, certainly nursery stock wise, people have generally gone over to the low temperature Krause eye, standing in a Krause eye, yeah, haven't they really? But, but actually, perhaps slightly overlooking Felty eye, which can work at, at cooler temperatures mm. later in the season, but not to the same degree as, uh, as Krause eye. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like the Krause eye you mentioned, Andrew, it's, it's active down to five degrees. So yeah, uh, yeah. Got, Whereas I, I think Felty eye is probably more. Uh, well, what, 10, 12, something like that? Yeah, right? pro probably similar to the heterodapsis yes. and the yes. carcapsii, so... Um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but de definitely another option, just, just again, just to have other options rather than just going to the same product every time. But uh, yeah, I think Felti just needs using early. It's not really a winter product. <clears throat> That's it. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, good, good. Andrew's just saying he's using all three, so that's a good approach. Good, yeah. Yeah. So tips for controlling adult vine weevil. We haven't got much um, in the way of controls. So we can get overwintered adults appearing in April and May, or new adults typically in June or July. But as we said, the life cycle is somewhat blurred these days with milder winters, um, production under protection, etc. The only sort of spray that we really can use and recommend in uh, in in ornamentals is Steward, which is an EAMU, um, and uh, it's. I would always say you better to control them before they get to adults with nematodes, which we know work very well, than try and rely on adult sprays um, because they're never really going to be as effective. 
<laughs> they're a bit hit and miss, David, aren't they? Really? Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, you know. Again, it's that. I think if ever there's a pest where a one size fits all remedy doesn't apply to vine weevil, isn't it? Really. Mm. Um, you know, going back to the old days when we used to use the, the compost incorporated products, it was slightly <coughs> different. You know, and some people may, or maybe not, hopefully not, perhaps remember Aldrin, etc. But moving on from that, we had Cudgel, and then we had Suscon Green. And, and they were very much a, a sort of, you know, did give you a, not quite complete control, but gave you a good degree of control. But these days, the whole thing has changed. That's what we've lost those products, probably for good reason. And mm. now I think it does need more of a holistic approach, doesn't it, really? So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, there is, a, there is a little niche, isn't it, for controlling adults to support control of the larvae, but uh, you couldn't just rely on it. I think the other quick thing about adults is timing, isn't it? If you're spraying for adults early evening, high water volume to get really good application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Early evening's the time. And um, <clears throat> if you, you know, it, it's sort of, um, it's never really been clarified that whether you need to hit the adults by spraying them in the evening or whether them feeding on treated foliage is, is good enough. It's, it's a bit of a grey area. So mm. um, adult control is your last option where you've missed the boat on other things, really. Um, so, <clears throat> yes, yeah, the last option available to us. Are you, are you going to mention picture, uh, picture GR, David? Yes, that's another... another thing that I'd forgotten to include actually I was sorry about that um yes there's a garlic granule picture GR from ICL that uh, can be applied to <coughs> um top of growing media in the sort of when when you feel egg egg laying is at risk so um in summer and from memory it's a couple of applications um a year and uh, it's all on the product label and this has got some quite good support in literature and I think they persist from about for about six weeks from memory but just a sort of word of caution they they think that garlic isn't overly compatible with nematodes so the advice is to leave again I think six weeks from memory between your last picture application and then going in with applying your nematodes just to to, to not risk damaging your nematodes with the garlic product. Um, but as I say, it's, there's some good product literature to refer to. I think that's, that's right, Dave, because I'm going back a little <laughs> bit. I remember using garlic based sprays for controlling leaf nematodes, for example, on, on alpine saxifrages and things, actually. And it, yeah. they, they did work you know, reasonably well, but uh, um, so garlic and the nematodes don't mix. So use, I think it is about six week gap, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, uh, just a, a quick comment from Andrew coming in. Um, he's using chickens penned around the outside of a tunnel to keep keep them out, and he yeah. goes around with a torch at night. So, yeah, I mean they'll they'll scratch any out the green leaf litter, and uh, I think there was an old Adas leaf that years ago of chickens, but the uh, the only limitation is they can turn on the crop as well. Um, yes, and, uh, but penned outside the tunnel is fine. So, uh, yeah. I think at one stage our friends in Holland used to use, I seem to remember, you know, good friend Dave Hutchinson telling us about tales of chickens, etc. being used quite successfully. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they'll really scratch through any old leaf litter about the kind of place where adult yeah. vine weevil will hide up. Um, they are nocturnal, so they, they're often difficult to spot in the day. You normally see, um, see the leaf notching of the adults. Um, yeah rather than the actual adults feeding on the crop. So yeah, yeah. notching along the edge of leaves, fatinia, um, other such things they'll favour to feed on. Okay. It's always good, I think, Dave, to have you mentioned fatinia, good indicator, what I call indicator crops, isn't it? So if you're monitoring <laughs> and everybody's very busy and they haven't got a lot of time for crop monitoring, you can you can think of other examples, spider mites and choice, you can't you know, thrips and clematis, etc. And, and for vine little adults, is maybe just pick a couple of crops that you're seeing quite regularly, sort of as you go around the nursery and just check on those Virginia and Euonymus, uh, yeah. are good examples, aren't they? Really, Primula will be yeah. another one if you're looking for vine little adult damage, actually, and just use yeah. those to to help just help you sort of track what's going on, just as indicators. And often they'll act as almost trap plants themselves, won't they? Really, they'll just draw in the if you can sacrifice some of those, they can actually just go and feed on those and cause damage on those without going onto your other crops so much. Yeah, yeah, and they'll indicate the need for you to to be applying um, timing of your nematodes. nematodes. I mean, 
most people are, are taking the approach now that we've lost the soil incorporated products that they're they're treating particularly susceptible species for for vine weevil um as sort of an insurance policy now yeah. in the autumn winter and i'd say that's the best pro approach to take these days so yeah but just ask you on on that i mean the idea of sacrificial plants does that would it just not mean that you are actually breeding up a, a larger um source of um, vine weevils um, well i suppose it could do yeah i mean i guess the, the thing to do would be to just make sure that you dispose of the sacrificial plants not yeah. i'm not quite sure who's where the question who's coming in with the question but um sorry, not to have them there for too long is it callum i'm not sure yes, sorry, yeah. hi callum yeah. um it's a fair point, though, I must admit, you know. Um, so I think if you're going to do that, just to use them as a, as a bit of a, a trap plant, as a, as, a, as a sort of to draw them in, if you like, it's not to, it's to dispose them on a fairly regular cycle. But it's just a thought. It, it is a, a line of thought is to actually use them as an attractant, if you like, and then rather than going to the whole crop, actually just sacrifice a few plants. But you'd need to do it on a fairly regular cycle. I agree, it's a fair point. I, I used to <laughs> I used to use the bantams for that for that reason. They were very... Okay, right. Very happy to do it. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for, for Tinny is an interesting one because we often see um, damage on the, the plant, but it's, I would say, very rare to find weevils in the roots of Fatinia, so they don't seem to favour it for egg laying, whereas things like Hookra and um, Stilby, they absolutely love. So if this sort of trap plant idea, if you have got the odd Fatinia about, it's sort of a way of gauging your adult activity and then that helps you to to think yes i really need to be drenching with nematodes as we move into the autumn to control and break the life cycle so um that's an approach that soon could be taken that's an interesting point though about petunia because I, I got one or two nurse stock growers who routinely get adult damage but now you mentioned it actually thinking about it you, you don't often see the larvae going onto the roots do you actually on petunia no, they don't seem to. That's like a good, them. good sort of indicator. Although they can, you know, sort of make it, make it, you know, take a crop off stale, can't they? When they mm. do a lot of feeding damage on the foliage, but uh, that mm. that's a good, good indicator stroke, sort of, you know, target crop, isn't it? Those sacrificial. You have one or two of those around, but they are quite high value as well, of course. Yeah. Um, next slide, then, please. Yeah, I thought that was the last one. So um, that's us pretty much done. Um, Thanks, everyone. Just, I could just briefly jump in, uh, just to say, um, could we just ask if anybody is experiencing any other sort of main pest problems through the summer months that perhaps you know we haven't sort of chatted about in this session? Um, but feel free to just to sort of speak up if you like. If there is anything you'd like to like to cover, we've perhaps exhausted everybody. Uh, oh, how okay. Callum here, I was just saying, um, on Michael. lemon verbena, um, terrible red spider mite, I had to cut them all back. Um, and it's, it's partly because I didn't notice them, I didn't notice them building up because I wasn't looking. So it's a usual thing of once you've, once I've noticed it's there, it's sort of got too large a infestation yeah. to do anything about. Yeah. yeah. What, what would you normally use, Callum? Would you, and it's a bit tricky on. Being well, it, yes, I mean, I would normally, it, it's, especially with, I have a great, most of my customers um, have a, a fit if they hear anything about uh, what they consider to be chemicals. So I would normally wash them off, something like that. Or okay. I have, I mean, I haven't past used, um, um, oh, what do I mean? The Paris, the Predator? Quite serious. Quite serious, yeah. 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 Um, reasonably successfully, because they're, they're mostly in the polytunnel. Yeah, but I, I think for, for my point is my my learning is 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 taking my eye off the ball, and then suddenly turning yeah. around and seeing the leaves have all gone, lotchy, and of course they're there in there. Uh, and uh, the oh. Californicus is quite a good predator mite as yes. well. I think. Yes, that's good for it, particularly in the midsummer period when it's hotter, isn't it? It's more tolerant of high temperatures, and and you know it will go and feed off other things apart from spider mite whereas phytosulis that, that you mentioned callum that tends to just go off after the spider mite so if they if they're not there then it does tend to die out with california because i think you probably need the two together david don't you in a combo in a bit of a program really but 
yeah, they work, they comp definitely complement each other. Um, just check with the supplier because the release licenses of California certainly at one time did yeah. release yeah. limit its use to under glass rather that's than right. that's right. um, so yeah. that, I think that's still the case. So just it is, I think it is. Yeah. Um, the other thing I would say from Callum's point of view, you can put five sealers in at low rates, um, sort of starting at two per square meter. So it's always a difficult one when you're, you're busy and monitoring and keeping track of things and, and things can get away from you. But if, if you struggle to monitor a periodic low rate um, is not going to do any harm yeah. um, and, and the predators will build up with the pests um, and, and, Another technique that's quite useful, Phyto is a brilliant predator, if I see this person with this, um, it, it really knocks down yep. spider mite well. I've got people using it outside now as their main control because of a lack of good acaricides and getting very good results with it. It's the main key to success is just getting the right rate on for the, the job in hand. So you want that magic ratio of one predators, 10, predator, 10 pest mites, um, and choose an appropriate rate for scale of the infestation. So I saw some choice here yesterday that they had been missed um, and they were getting away from them a bit. And uh, I think I'll probably suggest they go with a rate of sort of around 30 to 40 per square meter, but I've even had people use them at 50 per square meter and they see that as really as effective as a knockdown spray, that high rate. Yes, it might be a bit more expensive, but um, it works very well. And, and I've certainly had experience of insecticides for two spotted spider mite not performing brilliantly. Um, and that, that can be linked to dynamic applied in the wrong conditions because bright sunlight breaks it down rapidly. Mm. Um, and there may be a bit of resistance knocking about as well. Um, but uh, yeah, play with the rates if you've got problems. That's the message, really. Mine just briefly, David, be worth it. I don't know with Callum whether you're using things like Majestic or Eradicote Max or these shop position, physically acting sort of products at all. Um, not too good if you've got hot spots, as David says, but just as a little bit of a support tool to your biocontrol if things are starting to stray out of hand. Thank you very much, um, Andrew. And um, thank you, David, for such a great um, presentation. <laughs>